All Laureates in Life Science and Medicine 2007. May I first of all invite Professor P.C. Chang, Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of Shaw College to deliver the welcoming speech. Professor Chang, please. Professor Lavkovis, Mrs. Lavkovis, Professor Liu, Professor Cho, distinguished guests, fellow students, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. This is the fourth year of awarding Saw Prize. As you may know, the presentation ceremony for the Saw Prize 2007 was successfully held two days ago. The Saw Prize was established under the auspicious of Mr. Run Run Shaw in November 2002 to honor individuals, regardless of race, nationality, and religious belief, who have achieved significant breakthrough in academic and scientific research or application, and whose work has resulted in a positive and profound impact of the mankind. The Saw Prize consists of three annual awards astronomy, life science and medicine, and mathematical sciences. For this year's Saw Prize in Life Science and Medicine, it was awarded to Professor Robert J. Lafcobus of the Duke University for his relentless elucidation of the major receptor system that mediates the response of cells and organs to drugs and hormones. Today, we have the honor to have invited Professor Robert Lafkovas, the Saw Prize Laureate in Life Science and Medicine 2007, to deliver the Saw Prize Lecture on seven transmembrane receptors. Professor Lafkovas will share with us his research findings in this very important field and to give us further insight on how biomedical science can benefit the community at large. We are grateful that Professor C.H. Cho Chairman of the Department of Pharmacology of the Chinese University of Hong Kong has agreed to introduce the laureate and to moderate the Q&A section after the lecture. Saw College is most privileged to be able to host the fourth Saw Prize lecture in our campus. This has a special meaning to us, not only because both the Saw Prize and the Saw College have a common benefactor, but we are exceptionally delighted to witness the nations of the Saw Prize since its initial planning. And as a matter of fact, the announcement of the establishment of the Saw Prize was held in this auditorium five years ago. We are grateful to Mr. Soran Man Shaw for his generosity and particular concern for youth education that make possible the formation of Saw College at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. At the same time, we have the highest regards for his dedication and passion in the promotion of scientific advancement that made the creation of Saw Prize feasible. Without further ado, may I now invite Professor Cho to introduce today, today's distinguished speaker, Professor Robert Lafkovas. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Robert J. Lukovics, the Saw Laureate in Life Sciences and Medicine 2007. Professor Lukovics is being honored for his marked contribution to the discovery of the major receptor system that mediates the responses of cells and organs to drugs and hormones. Professor Nikowicz is an investigator of the Howard Hills Medical Institute and also the J James Bay Duke Professor of Medicine and Biochemistry at Duke University Medical Center at Durham, North Carolina. He was born in New York City. He attained the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and received his MD degree in 1966 in the same city. He completed residency training in internal medicine at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. In 
and the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He served for two years from 1968 to 1970 in the Clinical and Research Associate at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and completed a, a clinical and research fellowship in cardiovascular sciences at the Massachusetts General Hospital from 1971 to 1973. He joined the faculty at Duke University in the same year. Professor Nikowitz has, has been elected to the Association of American Physicians, the USA National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine and National Academy, Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received more than 50 prestigious international awards and prizes, as well as several uh, honorary degrees. Amongst these prizes, Professor Nickowix has this year received an Al Al Albany Medical Center Prize in Medicine and Biochemical Biomedical Research, and the Shaw Prize in Life Sciences and Medicine. Professor Nickowix is the author of more than 800 papers in the field of receptor biology and cell signaling. Today, Professor Nikovic will deliver a lecture on seven transmembrane receptors, also known as G-protein coupled receptors. They represent the largest, most versatile, the most ubiquitous of several families of plasma membrane receptors. They regulate virtually all known physiological responses in mammals, including sensory transduction, such as vision, smell, and taste. Moreover, such receptors are the commonest target of currently used therapeutic drugs, such as beta blockers, antihistamines, opioids, and angiotensin receptor blockers. They are important for hypertension, allergic reactions, and pain. Despite the long interest in receptors, it was not until the 1970s that the first molecular approaches to studying these critical cellular molecules were developed. In his lecture, Professor Nekowitz will deliver how this de development of novel technologies for studying the receptors, purifying them, and cloning their genes has led to explosion of knowledge about the receptors and has greatly facilitated the development of many new drugs. Amongst the most important insights was the key di discovery in 1986 that the beta-2 adrenergic receptor for adrenaline had special structure in which the polypeptide chain crossed the plasma membrane seven times. This breakthrough spurred research in laboratories around the world. And that led to the cloning of genes for superfamily. He has also described the mechanism which regulates receptor function, leading to this desensitization or diminished responsiveness when they are persistently stimulated. Indeed, Professor Nikovic has discovered two new families of proteins of that desensitized G-protein coupled receptor, a finding that has helped scientists understand how receptors become tolerant to certain drugs. His recent discoveries about this regulatory system, which have the potential to lead to an entirely new form of therapeutics, will also be described. I would like to extend our warmest welcome to Professor Nikovic and wish, wish him and his family a pleasant stay at CUHK and also in Hong Kong. Professor Nikovic, please. 
you very much. It's, uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, be here today to present this lecture. Uh, and certainly a pleasure to see so many students uh, in the audience today. As you heard, I'm going to be talking today about receptors. These are molecules that have been imagined uh, to be present in cells with which hormones and drugs initially interact. And these receptors have fascinated biologists for more than a century. And they've certainly fascinated me and captivated my attention for the entirety of my research career. Now, as you've just heard, receptors of the so-called seven transmembrane receptor family, that is to say receptors whose polypeptide chain crosses the plasma membrane seven times, represent the largest family of receptors that we know of. And as you've just heard, these receptors regulate a vast array of physiological processes, essentially every physiological process. And most importantly, from the standpoint of clinical medicine, these receptors represent the commonest and most important target of therapeutic drugs that we use in the clinic today. As you've heard, uh, there, there are literally hundreds of examples, but beta blockers, opiates, drugs which interact with serotonin or dopamine receptors are all exemplary uh, of this receptor family. Now, in my lecture today, I'd like to cover three interrelated subjects. First, I want to give you a very brief, rapid survey of the history of how we have arrived at our current state of understanding of this remarkable receptor family, hanging the thread of the story on some of my own work done over the past 35 years. Then, I'd like to bring you right up to the minute on some of the most interesting and exciting results going on in our laboratory. And finally, in the last few minutes, I want to indicate to you why I think that these findings, findings which are fundamentally altering our understanding of how the receptors function and are regulated, how this new understanding, we believe, can be utilized or leveraged to create an entirely new form of therapeutic agent. So let's get started then. Now, as you heard, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, physiologists and pharmacologists were busy studying receptors, but they really had no direct way of even establishing that they existed. And it wasn't really until the early 1970s, about the time that I began doing my work, that there were any methods available to study receptors in molecular or biochemical terms. And in fact, at this time, you may be surprised to learn, there was still great skepticism as to whether receptors really even existed. And in fact, I want to show you a quotation from a very famous pharmacologist, Raymond Alquist, that, was, uh, that he wrote in 1973, as recently as 1973. The quotation is somewhat ironic in the sense that Alquist himself, 20 years before, in the late 1940s, had actually developed the idea that there were distinct subtypes of adrenergic receptors, that is, of receptors for adrenaline, which he called alpha and beta. And that was based on some classical physiological studies that he had done. Nonetheless, as late as 1973, Alquist wrote as follows. This would be true if, this would be true uh, if I was so presumptuous as to believe that alpha and beta receptors really do exist. There are those that think so, and even propose to describe their intimate structure. To me, they are merely a concept conceived to explain observed responses of tissues produced by chemicals of various structure. And so what Alquist is basically saying is he doesn't even believe there is such a thing in molecular terms as a receptor. And I could give you other quotations from other famous scientists like Earl Sutherland, the Nobel laureate, etc., along similar lines at about the same time. And so it was against this background of frank skepticism as to the even ex existence of receptors 
that I began my work in the early 1970s. And what was clear to me was that if I was going to bring these mythical receptors to life and prove that they existed and could be studied with modern techniques, it would be necessary to develop a whole new set of technologies which did not then exist. And the first of these would have to be so-called radio ligand binding assays. That is, a way of studying the receptors directly. And so in the early 1970s, with my students and fellows, I set out to develop such direct ligand binding approaches for the study of the adrenergic receptors, the adrenaline receptors. Now, I'm often asked, why did you pick the adrenergic receptors, and in particular, the beta adrenergic receptor as the models to use for your studies. And there were really two sets of reasons, quite distinct. One reason was quite logical uh, and considered, and the other was really quite personal and emotional. The logical reason was that at the time, there were already many different drugs available with different chemical structures, which were thought to work on adrenergic receptors. And I knew I would need to do a lot of chemistry uh, to get this done. I would need to develop photo affinity probes, affinity chromatography resins, radio ligands, and the more chemical structures I had to work with, the better. So I thought the adrenergic receptors would be a good target based on that. But the other is that I was, at the time, a young, aspiring academic cardiologist. And I wanted to work on something with obvious cardiovascular relevance. And obviously, alpha and beta adrenergic receptors are so central to the regulation of the cardiovascular system that it seemed to me that that would be a good place to start. And so, as I mentioned, we uh, were successful in the early 1970s in developing a variety of radio ligands for the beta adrenergic receptors and subsequently the alpha adrenergic receptors. And these uh, radio ligand binding techniques rapidly bore fruit. And we were, for example, able to discover that the receptors were not static entities on the plasma membrane, but were dynamically regulated. Their numbers went up and down, and their properties changed under various physiological and pathophysiological conditions. We also were able to develop a variety of theories uh, relevant to how these receptors worked. And I won't go into those today. And very importantly, we were able to use them to discover new receptor subtypes, which immediately greatly expanded uh, the number of drug targets and led to the development in the pharmaceutical industry of many new uh, drugs. But perhaps one of the most important consequences of our developing these direct approaches to studying the receptors was that we were now able to begin the difficult but important task of trying to purify them in molecular terms. Now, this was an extraordinarily daunting process because the receptors are so rare. They're almost like trace contaminants in the plasma membrane. And before one can even begin the endeavor, one needs to develop procedures for solubilizing the receptors, for getting them out of the plasma membrane. They're not soluble proteins. We were successful in this. And ultimately, the key to our success in purifying these rare receptors, and I want to remind you that we, the purification required was basically several hundred thousand fold over the starting materials. But we were successful in this because we were able to develop affinity chromatography resins for the purification of each of the then four known subtypes of adrenergic receptor. And uh, this was done, again, with a variety of students and fellows in my laboratory. In each case, we were able to chemically couple either beta or alpha adrenergic receptor antagonists, beta blockers, alpha blockers, to sephiros supports, solid supports, using a variety of chemical procedures. We could then take solubilized extracts of tissues, pass these over the affinity chromatography columns, the very rare receptor molecules, typically one out of 200,000 molecules in these extracts, would stick to the beta or alpha blocker on the column. We would wash all the other proteins away, and then we would elute or remove the purified receptors from the column by passing through a very concentrated solution of another alpha or beta adrenergic drug. In the end, as shown on these uh, 
SDS polyacrylamide gels, we were able to completely purify uh, the receptors to homogeneity. By the way, these slides are all being truncated on the right, and I don't know if there's some way to, uh, to change the projection, but the right side here is, is missing uh, a significant amount of material. Uh, in any case, we were able to purify these receptors. That's what's indicated by these, these bands. So that we had a single type of molecule, a homogeneous protein. There we go. That's perfect. Thank you. Uh, a single homogeneous preparation of receptor molecule. And these isolated molecules could be shown to bind the adrenergic ligands, the drugs, with all the right specificity characteristics. So we were quite convinced that these were, in fact, the receptors. But the research community was not quite ready to accept this. There was lingering skepticism as to whether these truly were the receptors. And so to prove once and for all that we had the receptor molecule, we set out to develop procedures to show that this isolated molecule that we had achieved could in fact convey to a cell the ability to respond to adrenaline. I also want to point out that this single slide shown here on the right panel, one that I love to show in the 1980s, represents in a single slide about a dozen years of work by several dozen students and fellows, uh, all reduced to this one slide. Now, so what we did to prove once and for all that these isolated binding, receptor binding molecules were the receptor was to develop a reconstitution system. We started with a cell, which happens to be an erythrocyte from a particular kind of uh, frog called the Xenopus lavis. That's the African clawed toad. I won't go into the long story of why we wound up with that cell. But we were looking for a cell that had no beta adrenergic receptors. And it turns out virtually all mammalian cells have the receptors. So we found a cell which uh, the Xenopus lavis erythrocyte which had all the response elements that are normally coupled to the beta adrenergic receptor, such as the adenylate cyclase system, which, as you know, makes cyclic AMP. It also has other receptors, for example, those for prostaglandins. So if one takes this cell and stimulates it with a prostaglandin, one gets an increase in cyclic AMP. One gets signaling. But if you stimulate it with adrenaline, nothing happens. Now, we took our putative receptors, reconstituted them in phospholipid vesicles, fused those vesicles with the cells, and now, lo and behold, the cells which had been essentially given our receptor protein could now respond to adrenaline and all the other drugs which should uh, be active on a beta adrenergic receptor. And so we proved once and for all that we had, in fact, isolated the receptors, and now the research community finally accepted that these isolated molecules were receptors. Now, with bona fide validated receptor in hand, we were able to begin the difficult work of trying to clone the genes for the receptors to try to understand their structure. We took the very small amounts of receptor protein which we had obtained. We used uh, microsequencing methods which had been only recently developed, and in collaboration with a group at Merck Pharmaceuticals, we were able to uh, find five small peptide sequences of cryptic peptides that we had derived from our receptor protein. And I would point out to the biochemists in the group, we never had more than 25 micrograms of receptor protein in hand at any one time. However, we were successful in obtaining these little pieces of protein sequence. Those allowed us to design oligonucleotide probes, which we could use to try to clone the genes. And we were ultimately, after several years of a repeated failure, uh, able to clone the gene for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor in 1986. And when we looked at the deduced sequence, several remarkable surprises awaited us. This little cartoon, which was based on the work in that paper in 1986, demonstrates all what have now become the canonical features of these receptors. The polypeptide chain wove across the membrane seven times. These hydrophobic regions were connected by hydrophilic uh, sequences 
uh, forming the intra and extracellular loops. There were sites for regulatory protein phosphor phosphorylation on the tail and consensus sites for uh, N-glycosylation on the amino terminus. But most remarkable of all was the fact that the protein had actual sequence identities, shown in blue, with the visual pigment rhodopsin. And in fact, rhodopsin was also known to have seven transmembrane spans. Now, as many of you know, rhodopsin, the visual molecule, is like the beta adrenergic receptor coupled to a G protein or a guanine nucleotide regulatory protein. And we knew by the mid-1980s that there were functional analogies between the rhodopsin system, which is coupled to the G protein transducin, and hormone signaling systems like the beta adrenergic receptor, which is coupled to the GS protein and to cyclic AMP synthesis. But no one imagined that there would be structural similarities between these receptors and rhodopsin. In fact, the sequence of rhodopsin had been determined only a year or two before the beta adrenergic receptor, and interestingly, not by cloning, but by classical protein sequencing, Edmund degradation, because rhodopsin is so abundant in the retina that it needs almost no purification. Uh, retinal membranes, 90% of the protein in retinal membranes is rhodopsin, so it's an easy, pure, it is no purification. And the sequence had been determined by Edmund degradation and found to have seven membrane spans. Now, at that time, this would have been about 1984-85, there was only one other protein known to have seven transmembrane spans. And that was a protein called bacteria rhodopsin, which is a protein found in primitive archaebacteria, which is a light-sensitive proton pump. And since rhodopsin was also a light-sensitive protein. It was immediately assumed that seven membrane spans must be the signature feature of all light-sensitive proteins. Only with our cloning of the beta receptor did the idea emerge that perhaps these seven membrane spans was a signature feature of G-protein coupled receptors. And so we hypothesized in our first paper in 1986. We rapidly confirmed this notion by cloning the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor, and over the next several years, a total eventually of eight adrenergic receptors, all of which shared this sequence. So by 1987, we were quite convinced that there was a whole family of G-protein coupled receptors, all of which shared the seven membrane spanning arrangement, as well as sequence homologies, especially in the hydrophobic membrane spans. Thereafter, over the next few years, the family grew very, very rapidly as other scientists used homology approaches, such as low stringency screening of uh, libraries, cDNA libraries, PCR as it was developed, to, by homology, clone more and more members of the extended family. But virtually no one again ever purified one of these rare receptors again prior to its cloning. And thus, we always felt good about that long decade or more that we had spent purifying the receptors because the little pieces of protein sequence that we obtained from them essentially provided the Rosetta Stone, which allowed us to clone the first one of these receptors, which then opened up the field to further development. One of the consequences of this rapid expansion of sequences of receptors was, was the uh, development of a growing number of so-called orphan receptors. Now, orphan receptors are receptors where we know a sequence of a presumed receptor, and it seems to have seven membrane spans as determined by hydropathy plots. But you don't know what the ligand or the function is. Very soon after we cloned the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, we did genomic southern blots with the cDNA, and immediately saw that there were multiple other cross-reacting bands, presumably other receptors. We cloned one of these out from a size-selected library 
and it had seven membrane spans. And we thought it must be another adrenergic receptor, presumably the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which pharmacologically is the most closely related. In fact, it did not bind beta-1 adrenergic receptor ligands, and it became the first orphan. We had no idea what it was. But within a year, we were able to figure out that it was a serotonin receptor, the first serotonin receptor to be cloned. Subsequently, many other orphan receptors were sequenced. In fact, there are two very prominent examples of large subfamilies of receptors which were initially orphans. For example, in 1991, Buck and Axel uh, cloned the uh, olfactory receptors, a huge subfamily which accounts for about half of the thousand receptors in this family. To this day, almost all of those are orphans. We still don't know which olfactory receptors react with which odorants. And then about 10 years later, Zucker's group cloned the taste receptors, the sweet and the bitter receptors. And all of these receptors look just like the beta adrenergic receptor and just like rhodopsin. They're all very closely related molecules. In fact, today, there are still uh, about 300 orphan G protein coupled receptors where we do not know the ligand or the function. And these represent an extraordinarily rich load for the pharmaceutical industry for the development of novel drugs. Now, with the sequences of these receptors in hand, we were able to move on uh, to try to understand how this highly conserved seven membrane spanning domain arrangement. And I would point out that to this day, nobody really understands why this particular structural arrangement is so highly conserved. But well, we were interested in any case in trying to understand how this conserved structure mediates the two classical functions of a receptor, namely binding ligands with appropriate specificity and activating signaling pathways with appropriate specificity. And to get at this, we use several techniques, including classical site-directed mutagenesis and the creation of the first so-called chimeric receptors. Briefly, let me tell you about that chimeric receptor approach because I think it was kind of neat and, and we did get some interesting insights. In this approach, we took two receptors, which, the first two receptors we had cloned, the beta-2 and the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors. Both of these are receptors for adrenaline and their sequences are 50% identical. In other words, half of all the residue are the same. Nonetheless, they bind ligands with distinct specificities, drugs which block one don't block the other. Despite their remarkable similarity in structure and the fact that they both bind adrenaline, the beta adrenergic receptor activates adenylate cyclase, leading to more cyclic AMP in the cell, whereas the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor inhibits adenylate cyclase. They do opposite things, and they combine with different G proteins. So what we did is we used recombinant DNA techniques to create about a dozen chimeric receptors. And in the scheme, the sequences we derive from the beta receptor are shown in orange, and those from the uh, alpha-2 receptor in blue. The two, here, this scheme shows you about half of those chimeric receptors, and these two were the most informative. You can see that they're mostly blue sequence. That is to say, they're mostly alpha-2 adrenergic receptor, but with just a little bit of beta sequence. Now, these two chimeric receptors bound ligands with all the properties of an alpha receptor, which wasn't surprising because they were mostly alpha-2 receptors. But remarkably, they activated adenylate cyclase rather than inhibiting it. That is to say, this little piece of beta receptor was sufficient to convey on the chimeric receptor the properties of the beta receptor, at least with respect to signaling. Well, by using this approach iteratively, we were able to ultimately deduce exactly which sequences in these receptors were responsible for either ligand binding or activation of distinct signaling. And as shown here, the regions responsible for signaling, shown in blue, were those in the cytoplasmic domains of the receptor, which actually coupled to the G proteins, in closest apposition or proximity to the plasma membrane, which is shown by this bar. The rest of the molecule, the portions in the membrane spans, especially the outer half, and the extracellular loops are, are responsible for binding ligands. 
now while all this was going on we were also busy doing other work which led us to the discovery of a universal meg mechanism which regulates the function of all of these receptors now for the past 15 years or so two simple paradigms both largely developed based on work with the model beta 2 adrenergic receptor and rhodopsin have guided our understanding and our experimentation in this area. These two paradigms, referred to as activation and desensitization of the receptors, are in turn based on the fundamental understanding that three families of molecules share the following remarkable property, that they are able to bind or interact with the receptors, but in a strictly activation-dependent way. That is to say, they only interact with the receptor when the receptor is interacted with its specific agonist, such as adrenaline. Those three families of proteins are G-proteins, G-protein-coupled receptor kinases, or GRKs, and beta arrestors. Now, when the receptor is activated and goes into its active conformation, it interacts with the G-protein, leading to a series of events that leads to cellular responses by activation of second messenger generating uh, enzymes such as adenylate cyclase and activation of second messenger kinases such as PKA or PKC. On the other hand, the activated receptor is also immediately recognized by a GRK, a kinase, which transfers phosphate from ATP to the tail of the receptor. It phosphorylates the receptor, but only the active form. That leads to the binding of a second molecule called beta arrestin to the receptor, and that sterically prevents activation of the G protein, because the receptor can activate the G protein to signal if it's bound to beta arrestin, and then you get desensitization or turning off of the receptor. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about what led us to the discovery of these two families of proteins that turn off the receptors. That is to say, the G protein coupled receptor kinases and the beta arrestins. I had been interested in this remarkably pervasive phenomenon of desensitization uh, throughout my career. And I think the reason for that is, to me, it was perhaps the uh, most quintessential uh, representative of what is probably the, the broadest principle of physiology, referred to as homeostasis. That is to say, when you perturb a cell in any way, it has a tendency to return to its original state. And this is one of the most pervasive uh, principles of physiology. So in desensitization, we find that when a cell is stimulated through a receptor, very quickly it tends to decrease the extent to which it is signaling and to turn off. Well, as a result of my interest in this desensitization phenomenon, Virtually every time we would develop a new technique for studying the receptors, I would want to turn it back and use it to see if we could learn something about desensitization. And so when we developed, about 1980, the first photo affinity probes for the receptors, that is to say molecules which could be covalently inserted into the receptors to be used to tag them for purification and other studies, we immediately tried to look, using that relatively crude technique, as to whether uh, there was any effective desensitization that we could detect on the receptors. And as you can see in this SDS gel, as compared with a, uh, an undesensitized or normal receptor, the desensitized receptor showed a somewhat different mobility on the gel. At the time, it had just been discovered that this type of slightly uh, retarded mobility in the SDS gel is often representative of protein phosphorylation. And so we set out uh, to see if, in fact, the receptors were phosphorylated. And very quickly, we were able to demonstrate that in association with their desensitization, the receptors were phosphorylated. At this time, a very talented graduate student, Jeffrey Benevic, joined my laboratory. And in a series of really remarkable studies for a graduate student over a period of just several years, he was able to first identify the enzyme responsible for the phosphorylation, which was a unique 
previously unknown kinase, which we initially named the beta adrenergic receptor kinase for obvious reasons. Today we refer to it as GRK, G protein coupled receptor kinase 2. We were then able to purify the enzyme to homogeneity to clone its gene. This immediately showed us that it was a novel kinase and an enzyme which established a new subfamily of kinases. Now, at about this time, contemporaneously, scientists working on the uh, molecular properties of signal transduction in the retina were studying an enzyme which seemed to be very analogous to BARC, or the beta adrenergic receptor kinase, and they had called it rhodopsin kinase. Rhodopsin kinase seemed to shut off visual signaling through rhodopsin, essentially the light receptor. Well, together with Chris Palczewski, we purified some rhodopsin kinase, cloned its gene, and sure enough, it looked very similar to BARC. They were, in fact, members of the same new subfamily of kinases, and thus we established that there was a family of G-protein coupled receptor kinases. We cl subsequently cloned another four kinases. Today, we know that the family of GRKs actually contains seven members in several different subsets, I won't go through it. They all have a very highly conserved uh, structure with a central catalytic domain flanked by two regulatory domains. Now, the beta arrestins were discovered as a direct consequence or outgrowth of our work on the GRKs. In the course of purifying the bark enzyme, we to our dismay, found that the more we purified the enzyme, that is to say the more active it was in phosphorylating the receptor, the more it lost its ability to desensitize the isolated receptor, which we assessed in a reconstituted system. This suggested to us that we might be losing something that was necessary for the desensitization, although we didn't know what, and we couldn't prove that was the case. But then at just about this time, Hermann Kuhn in Germany reported that a very abundant protein in the retina, which up to that time was called 48K protein because it was 48,000 molecular weight, or also S antigen, that this protein seemed to somehow work with rhodopsin kinase to deactivate rhodopsin. And so he rena renamed the protein arrestin because it seemed to be somehow working to help arrest signal transduction uh, through those uh, rhodopsin molecules. Well, we immediately thought to ourselves that his protein, 48K protein, might be similar to what we were losing in our purification. We knew it couldn't be 48K protein itself for the simple reason that its expression was limited to the retina. But we obtained some of the protein uh, from Kuhn, and sure enough, when we reconstituted it with our highly purified beta adrenergic receptor kinase preparations, it did restore the ability to desensitize. However, only at very, very high concentrations. This suggested to us that what we were losing in our purification was a molecule similar to, but not identical, with this visual arrestin. So, to make a long story short, within the year, the cDNA for visual arrestin was cloned by Shinohara's laboratory. Reasoning that what we were looking for was a molecule that would be not only functionally similar to arrestin, but structurally similar, we obtained the cDNA, and by low stringency hybridization, Martin Losey, a fellow in my laboratory, was able to clone a molecule which we called beta arrestin, now called beta arrestin 1. And within another year, Hovidotramadol was able to clone another highly related molecule, which we called beta arrestin 2. And with those purified and recombinant molecules in hand, we were now able to do experiments, which I won't go through in detail. Actually, missing a little bit of this slide. Oops. Can we fix that? There we go. Yeah. Can you bring it in a little more? Anyway, what we were able to show in a reconstituted system was that in the visual system, visual arrestin, authentic visual arrestin, was several hundredfold more potent than the beta arrestins in desensitizing rhodopsin. In the beta receptor system, the converse was true. The beta arrestins were 
very, very potent, and the arrestin was about a thousand times less potent. This is still truncated, by the way, on the right. Today we know that there are four members of the arrestin family. Arrestin 1 and X arrestin are limited in their expression to the visual system. Beta arrestin 1 and beta arrestin 2 are expressed in essentially all cells. The structure of the beta arrestins has been determined uh, crystallographically by the late Paul Sigler's laboratory. I'm not going to go into that. There are two domains, both largely anti-parallel beta sheets. Uh, and interestingly, the two domains resemble each other structurally, although they have no sequence similarity at all. Now, although we discovered the beta arrestins in the, con in the context of the molecules which desensitize or shut off receptors, today we know they actually do much more. For example, in addition to desensitization, it turns out that the arrestins mediate the uh, ligand-dependent internalization of receptors. We know, for example, today that virtually all of these receptors, when they are stimulated, go into the cell, thus reducing the number of receptors on the cell surface. It turns out that that internalization is mediated by the well-known clathrin coated pit endocytosis machinery. What we discovered was that the beta arrestins are adapters which link the receptors to various elements of the endocytic machinery, including clathrin, AP2, which is a clathrin adapter, and a variety of other molecules. And some of you may be familiar with the very interesting uh, post-translational modification of proteins known as ubiquitination. And again, not time to discuss it, but ubiquitination of beta arrestin is required for it to mediate the internalization of the receptors. Finally, and I think most interestingly, we discovered about five or six years ago Again, I'm losing the bottom of this slide, uh, the right corner. The beta arrestins also mediate signaling. Now, this was a big surprise, because remember, the beta arrestins were discovered as molecules, that's better, as molecules which turn off the receptors. But beginning with the tyrosine kinase, the receptor tyros, non-receptor tyrosine kinase, CSARC, Beginning about 2000, we were able to demonstrate that the beta arrestins can serve as signaling adapters or scaffolds which bind molecules such as SARC, bring them into complex with the receptors, and actually serve as signaling molecules in their own right. And over the last few years, the list of molecules which can be uh, brought into complex with the receptors through the beta arrestins has been growing. And a great deal of attention, as I'll show you, has been devoted to these MAP kinases. So what's been happening over the past five years or so is that there's been a real paradigm shift. What's emerged is that the Bereston GRK system is, in fact, bifunctional. On the one hand, of course, it desensitizes the receptors in terms of G-protein signal. But on the other, it's able to interact with these various effectors and serve as a signaling intermediate in its own right. So it both desensitizes G-protein signaling and turns on other signaling pathways. Now, the particular biochemical signaling pathway, which has been the most heavily studied in relation to Bereston signaling, is the MAP kinase signal. So just a few words about this very, very complicated system. But, and then I'll show you why the Berestins ha have turned out to be so important here. You may remember from your biochemistry that these MAP kinases are involved in regulating gene transcription. Each MAP kinase, and there are about 12 of these enzymes, they have names like ERK, JUNK, and P38. These are all uh, abbreviations or acronyms. Each of these is a member of what's called a kinase cascade. That is to say, each MAP kinase is phosphorylated and activated at turn by a MAP kinase kinase. And each of these, in turn, phosphorylated and activated by a MAP kinase kinase kinase, a triple kinase. Typically, once the MAP kinase is activated, it moves into the nucleus, phosphorylates transcription factors, activates them, and regulates complicated programs of gene transcription, which in turn regulate processes such as 
those shown here, which are crucial. Now, most importantly for our consideration is that virtually all receptors have turned out to activate these MAP kinase pathways by many, many different mechanisms. And this includes essentially all of the G-protein coupled receptors. Now, a conundrum emerged in the 90s about how these systems could be working. Because it was found that there were at least a dozen enzymes at each of these three levels. And yet the cell somehow, when it stimulated a receptor, had to put together an individual pathway in which, say, these three kinases in sequence were activated, or these three. And the question was, with so many kinases around, and remember the, the active lifetime of any one of the enzymes is very brief because it gets turned off by a phosphatase. The question was, how did they ever find each other in the cell? And the answer turned out to be that there were so-called scaffolds. This was first discovered in yeast with the discovery of a molecule called sterol 5, which was found to bind to a series of, of these three enzymes and essentially scaffold them together so they didn't have to find each other. Subsequently, some similar molecules were found in mammalian cells. We got interested in this about four or five years ago when in performing yeast to hybrid screens with beta arrestin looking for interacting proteins, we kept pulling out molecules of this type. Subsequently, we were in fact able to show that the beta arrestins were able to serve as scaffolds for several of these pathways, including uh, several of the junks, junk two and three, and the ERKs. But this immediately begged the question, what was the relationship of this berestin-mediated signaling to these MAP kinases to the previously well-established fact that G proteins could also activate these MAP kinases? And in order to get at that, we used a very interesting reagent that we had just read about at the time, and this would have been about three, four years ago, in the literature. And this was a molecule which activated angiotensin receptors. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with angiotensin, uh, the most potent vasoconstrictor that our body makes, and which is a, very important for regulating blood pressure. Angiotensin receptors, found on, for example, vascular smooth muscle, are receptors which are also, of course, members of this seven membrane spanning family. Now, this particular compound was a mutated form of angiotensin. Angiotensin is an octopeptide. It has eight amino acid residues. In this compound, which had been reported by the group of Karnik, two of those residues are altered. The compound is referred to as an angiotensin analog, and it's referred to as SII angiotensin, which is descriptive of the particular mutations that are in the protein. It doesn't matter. Now, what had been reported was that this molecule, when it interacted with the angiotensin receptor, could not activate the G protein, could not do the usual signaling things that it could do to lead to calcium release and vasoconstriction, but that it could lead to internalization. Now that really caught my attention, because as I told you, I knew that the internalization was mediated by berestins. So this led to really the kind of radical hypothesis that perhaps when SII angiotensin bound to the receptor, even though it couldn't lead to interaction with G protein, it might in fact lead to interaction with beta arrestin. And so to test this idea, we synthesized some of this SII angiotensin and quickly confirmed what had been reported in the literature. Namely, for example, in a second messenger generation assay, PI turnover here, angiotensin was very, very active on cells expressing the angiotensin receptor, whereas the SII angiotensin, as reported, was dead. In another assay of G-protein activation called GTP gamma S binding, I won't go into it. Again, angiotensin is active. SII angiotensin is dead. It's also dead in calcium release assays, et cetera. So as reported, this molecule is not able to activate classical G-protein dependent signaling. So we then looked at whether it could lead to recruitment of beta arrestin to the receptors. To do this, we used HEK cells, which were stably expressing a fusion protein of beta arrestin and GFP, green fluorescent protein, a standard technique so that we could visualize the green molecule in cells 
And here you see the berestin throughout the cells and excluded from the nucleus. If we stimulate the cells with angiotensin, at two minutes, the berestin is drawn to the membrane, not shown here. And then after 20 minutes, the beta arrestin is internalized in endocytic vesicles. Not shown here is that the receptors are present in the same vesicles. But when we did the same experiment with the SII angiotensin, as you can see, it was as effective as the angiotensin. So despite the fact that the compound, SII angiotensin, is not active with respect to conventional signaling, it can still do this. So the question now is, OK, can that lead to signaling? In particular, can that lead to the MAP kinase signaling that I just described to you? So we took the cells, and we measured this MAP kinase using an enzymatic assay, and we stimulated with angiotensin itself. And you can see that you get a burst of activity, which is very prolonged, out to an hour. Then we used a recently developed technique. I'm sure you're all aware of it. The Nobel Prize was awarded last year for the development of RNAi, uh, RNA interference techniques, techniques which can be used to essentially reduce the expression of virtually any protein in cells in a highly selective way. So we used RNA interference, siRNA, to reduce very much the concentration selectively of one of the berestins, beta arrestin 2. This is a Western blot shows the two, uh, an immunoblot. These are the two forms of berestin, one and two. After the treatment of the cells with the siRNA, berestin one is expressed at a normal level, and berestin two is dramatically reduced. When we do that and repeat the stimulation with angiotensin, as you can see, there's a burst of activity, but the late activity is very much diminished. And the early activity is very transient. The hypothesis would be that having eliminated the berestin, that the residual activity is G-protein signaling. Now, if we wanted to see the putative berestin-mediated signaling, we should see that if we could eliminate G-protein signaling. And to do that, we simply used a protein kinase C inhibitor. And when we did that, you can see that the early activity seemed to disappear. And now we got late, very sustained activity. So this led us to believe, then, that both the G protein and the berestin might be able to mediate some component of the MAP kinase activation. Well, if that's true, then if we used both the PKC inhibitor to eliminate G protein and the siRNA to eliminate berestin activity, we should eliminate all of the enzyme. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And just for fun, if you just add up these data points, you add the two together, you pretty much do get the total. So this is consistent with the idea that there are two forms of signaling. One, mediated by G proteins, is rapid but very transient due to the desensitization caused by the residual berestin-1. The berestin-mediated activity is slower but much more sustained. Interestingly, berestin-1 does not lead to ERK activation. And in fact, it's actually inhibitory to that. Another point I won't go into, because time is getting late, is that the ERK, the MAP kinase ERK, activated through the G protein, and that activated through the berestin, not only have very different time courses, they actually wind up in different places in the cell. These are confocal microscopic uh, images. I'm not going to go through them in detail. I just want to focus you here. Here we're actually looking directly at phospho ERK, that's the active form of ERK, in the cell using an antibody which recognizes only this active form of ERK or phospho ERK. You can see that at two minutes after stimulation with angiotensin, the ERK activity is found throughout the cell, mostly in the cytoplasm and also in the nucleus. Remember, that's when the G protein activity is being found. At 30 minutes, when, as I showed you, 30 minutes, this is almost all berestin activity. You can see the nucleus is clear, and now all the activity is in these endocytic vesicles in the cytoplasm. So the G protein activity is throughout the nucleus and the cytoplasm, but the berestin mediated activity is only in the endocytic vesicles. So to summarize that, the model is that when you activate one of these receptors, 
it's able to signal in two distinct ways, through either berestin or through G-protein. Now, what I'm showing you he here is a specific biochemical system in which this occurs, the MAP kinase signaling system, but I could show you many others. The G-protein-stimulated activity goes to the nucleus and regulates gene transcription, the classical paradigm you've learned about for MAP kinases. The berestin-mediated ERK activity is restrained in the cytoplasm, is held in the cytoplasm out of the nucleus by the beta arrestins, and there it phosphorylates other substrates leading to other physiological effects. What physiological effects? Well, we're very much in the process of trying to understand these right now, but they appear to include uh, factors which are importantly related to the regulation of the cytoskeleton, cellular mobility and motility, anti-apoptotic effects, etc. Many very important effects. Now, I want to summarize for you and explain in the last five minutes or so why this new insight that beta arrestins can actually signal as well as desensitize G protein, why this may well serve as the basis for a new form of therapeutics. So what I've shown you is that when an agonist, a stimulator like angiotensin or adrenaline binds to its receptor, it activates it, changes its shape. This leads to activation with the G protein, and you get signaling. Then the GRK phosphorylates, berestin binds, blocks the signaling, desensitization. But now signaling intermediates brought with it lead to signals, which can enhance cell survival, decrease cell death, increase myocardial contractility, a whole variety of physiological processes, which I don't have time to go into now. Active and active. Agonists, stimulators like adrenaline or angiotensin for its receptor or many others, are molecules which stabilize or induce the receptor into the active form. But what this finding with SII angiotensin shows is that there must be multiple active forms of the receptor, at minimum two, and I frankly believe it's many more than that. But there must be at least two active conformations, one which can activate G protein and another which can activate berestin, and SII is only able to induce the one that does berestin. Now, why is this important from the point of view of drug development? That's shown here. Consider that this is SII angiotensin bound to its receptor. It is not activating the G protein signaling. By definition, that makes it an antagonist, a blocker, with respect to G protein signaling, because it's sitting on the receptor and blocking angiotensin. But at the very same time it's, that it's blocking adrenaline, if it, was, if it was a beta receptor ligand, or the angiotensin receptor in this case, at the very same time that it blocks signaling through G, it is itself mediating signaling to these other processes. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of how that might apply to drug development. Two of the commonest drugs, the most useful drugs used to treat heart disease in the world today are beta blockers, that is, drugs which block or antagonize at the beta receptor, and angiotensin receptor blockers. That is to say, drugs which block the action of angiotensin at the angiotensin receptor. Both endogenous angiotensin and adrenaline stimulate the heart and vessels and can lead to heart disease in susceptible patients when that stimulation is too uh, protracted and goes on day after day. This is what makes blockers of adrenaline and of angiotensin so useful in the treatment of heart disease. Angiotensin receptor blockers are referred to as ARBs, for angiotensin receptor blockers. So beta blockers and angiotensin blockers work by antagonizing the negative or deleterious effects of either adrenaline or angiotensin on the heart and vasculature. But all such drugs are antagonists of both the G protein and the berestin signal. We believe that drugs such as SII angiotensin 
or analogous compounds for the beta receptor, as an example, might be, if you will, super blockers. That is to say, like ARBs, conventional ARBs or beta blockers, they do block all the deleterious effects mediated through the G protein. But at the very same time, they entrain signaling, which leads to positive signaling to enhance cell survival or decrease cell death through the beta arrestin dependent signaling processes. And we believe that this may be an added advantage in such drugs. And in fact, we already have preliminary data with SII angiotensin, in which we have administered it to genetically altered mice uh, which uh, are programmed to go into heart failure. This is a genetically altered strain of mice. They express a calcium binding protein transgenically in the heart called calcioquestrin. All of these animals die by uh, 16 weeks in profound heart failure. We've been able to show that administration to such animals of SII angiotensin dramatically slows the rate of progression of the heart failure consistent with this idea. And so we're pushing ahead in an attempt to prove this with other drugs. And in fact, we already have preliminary data for some beta adrenergic compounds, which are, if you will, biased antagonists of this type. Now, in concluding, uh, I want to, of course, acknowledge uh, the fact that the work that I have shown you uh, in the last hour or so was performed by a large number of students and fellows over a 35-year period. And I could show you a list of their names, uh, but that wouldn't really mean much. And I do want to acknowledge uh, all their hard work. So I thought I would show you a photograph uh, to just sort of uh, represent a token of this. And it's a photograph taken four years ago at my 60th birthday. So on that occasion, Duke held a two-day symposium in my honor. Uh, a variety of Nobel laureates and, and other luminaries came to speak. And approximately 100 uh, of my 200 former trainees, many of whom are deans and professors, uh, came there. And at the very end of that, a photograph was taken. Uh, and here it is. And that's me. And that's my wife, Lynn. And here's about half of the people who've trained with me over the years and who are responsible for the work that I showed you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lefkovitz. Could you please stay and take a seat for the Q&A session? And may I also invite Professor Cho to come up and moderate the session? Professor Cho, please. I'm sure that everybody shared with me that uh, we enjoy very much about the very inspiring lecture. We learn a lot of this kind of seven membrane transmembrane receptors. And also knowing that the basic science can be very useful to be transcribed, become therapeutic useful drugs. So uh, I think we learn more from, in order to learn more from about this lecture, uh, students from the floor and colleagues from the different institutions would like to ask few questions. We have a few minutes to, for you to know more about the receptors. Any questions from the floor? Yeah, so the back. I'm William Wu from Department of Pharmacology. Uh, it was uh, reported last year that uh, nicotine can stimulate uh, uh, lung cancer cell proliferation through the alpha-7 uh, nicotine receptor by recruiting the beta resting to the receptor and, med and mediate CSRS phosphorylation. Uh, this finding implied that uh, beta resting is not specific to the G protein couple receptor. Uh, could you uh, comment on whether uh, this is in uh, bit, um, the nicotine, the, the nicotine acetylcholine receptor is an exception, or the beta arresting is much more promiscuous than we previously thought? This is an excellent question. Let me, let me repeat it as I understand it. 
Uh, the young man is saying that there was a paper published last year, I think it was in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, yes. if I G remember, uh, showing that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, sort of the granddaddy of the uh, ion channel receptors, was able to recruit berestin and signal through these mechanisms. And uh, I read that paper with great interest, and I think it's a very important paper, because the nicotinic cholinergic receptor is a member of a completely distinct, structurally and functionally distinct family of receptors. And not, a, not for a moment would one have expected that beta arrestins would have interacted with this receptor. So the question is, do I think this is the exception or that the arrestins may in fact uh, interact with many other types of receptors? My answer is, I think it's the latter. I think it interacts with many other types of receptors, always in a stimulus-dependent way. That's the magic so that even with the nicotinic receptor, again, it followed the paradigm of interacting only in a stimulus-dependent way. And there have been several other examples. The, the, for example, the uh, IGF-1 receptor, the insulin-like growth factor 1 receptor, which is a classical tyrosine kinase receptor, also recruits perestin, it's been reported, in a stimulus-dependent way. And then yet another completely different family, uh, notch, the notch receptor, is to interact with Breston. So I think we may be at the very beginning of our understanding of just how broad are the interactions of this family of molecules. Thank you for that question. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like to tell us about uh, beta resting? Uh, I want to know beta resting uh, could be uh, secreted out of a cell. I'm not sure I understand. You want to know if beta restin can be separated? Uh, beta restin just uh, work in uh, in the cell. But it's acting I want to know. Uh, beta Whether it acts inside the cell. Yes, I think it does. And in fact, one of the more uh, interesting aspects, it, it is the two berestins have different subcellular distributions. Berestin 2, as you saw in that confocal micrograph, is limited in its distribution to the cytoplasm because it has a nuclear exclusion signal in its sequence. Beta restin 1 actually doesn't have such a sequence, and it acts both in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. And in fact, uh, one of the really important developments in, in our field over the last couple of years was the discovery published in Cell about a year or two ago uh, by somebody I'm very proud of, Gang Pai. Uh, <laughs> Uh, who uh, recently moved to Shanghai, I understand. Uh, oh, actually, he's been in Shanghai, but he's taken on a new position there. But Gang Pai discovered that beta arrestin 1 can actually signal in the nucleus uh, by altering uh, certain epigenetic phenomena. And I, that was a big discovery, because prior to that, we thought it only worked at the membrane and in the cytoplasm. Thank you. I think. Um, <clears throat> I'm a humble clinician who prescribe beta blockers and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers every day without knowing how they work. Um, <laughs> can I ask you, um, you, you mentioned that there are many um, receptors, superfamilies with very similar structures, but still find, trying to find uh, what kind of molecules uh, they are interacting with. Um, just a philosophical question, why would Mother Nature create so many uh, keys without uh, so many locks that still couldn't find a key? <laughs> and um, where, uh, would there be any endogenous um, uh, compounds which is actually working on these receptors, but still we have no idea what they are and what, what are their functions? Thank you. It's a wonderful question, thank you. Uh, so we're being asked about all these orphan receptors that are out there, and why the good Lord put those in the, in, in the cell. And I think the most likely answer is every one was put there to interact with a different endogenous substance. And I think, first of all, there are probably many neurotransmitters and hormones, if you will, uh, which have yet to be discovered. Uh, and, of course, the decoding of the genome is going to help enormously with this. Uh, I'm aware of one company which is uh, doing the following. They have found that there appear to be 
something like uh, three or 500 sequences of molecules in the genome, which from their sequence would be predicted to be secreted peptides, that is to say, proteins which would circulate in the blood, but whose functions are completely unknown. So those are essentially orphan ligands, if you will. And then there are several hundred orphan GPCRs. And what this particular company is trying to do is to match those. So I think the answer is there's an extraordinary amount of biology yet to be discovered. Uh, and it's hard to imagine just how the effect that that may have on clinical medicine in the future. But I think each of those orphan receptors has, it, has one or more endogenous ligands. All of this yet to be discovered. Follow up question. So these are orphans that uh, still haven't found their parents, but they exactly should be. Exactly right, either for the receptor or the ligand. Another um, more personal questions, if you allow. You publish 800 papers in 35 years, which means that on average you probably publish 23 papers uh, in your career every year. So how to keep up the momentum of 23 <laughs> papers a year? Well, if it, if it gives you any insight, uh, the license plate on my car is Turbo Bob. <laughs> That's probably the best I can do with that. <laughs> is there any further questions? Could, could I ask you one question about sure. the... Uh, uh, I think, do you think there's an, any racial difference between Asians and Westerners? Are there any G protein couple receptors? Are they different in function? For example, the drug company want to launch a drug in, in China. Yeah. They have to do a clinical trial because we cannot try, try, uh, direct translate all the data from the Western country to China because we have different response to drugs. Are they related to G protein? They are different type or, or molecularly or different kind of signal transduction or this is, this is a very interesting question. So this goes to the heart of, of, of a a subject area known as pharmacogenomics, right? So pharmacogenomics is the area which refers to the fact that different populations of humans respond differently to the same drug. And how do we know about this? Well, the idea is that there are subtle differences in essentially all proteins uh, which can modify their functions. It's already known that there are a number of such polymorphisms, as they're called, in GPCRs. And a former uh, student of mine, Steve Liggett, has published on the beta adrenergic receptor uh, that there are several polymorphisms uh, which uh, can change the response of the beta receptor to certain drugs. And I'm trying to remember that they had a paper recently, and this would be a perfect example of this, where it was shown that there's a polymorphism in the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. And depending on whether you do or you don't have this polymorphism determines whether the administration of a particular beta blocker, I think it was bucindolone, works for you in heart failure. If you have the polymorphism, and it, it's very common in uh, African Americans, if you have the polymorphism, you respond well to the beta blocker and heart failure. But if you ha don't have that polymorphism, it doesn't work. It's a perfect example. And it's not hard to imagine that in Asian populations, there would be polymorphisms which will dictate clinically distinct responses, which sort of greatly complicates uh, the whole issue of therapeutics. On the other hand, with time, uh, these molecular changes will become known, and it will actually sharpen I think our ability to do these treatments. Thank you. Any questions from uh, up the second floor? Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to ask something about the mutant SII uh, angiotensin receptor, which you talk about in the talk. Uh, what properties does it have so that it activates the G protein? It, it fails to activate the G protein uh, pathway, but it activates the beta arrestin pathway? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. You're asking about. What role does it have? And uh, what properties does the, angio, uh, the mutant angiotensin ligand have? The SII? 
Yes, that's yeah. right. Yep. So it's interesting. Uh, we have some data on that. The prediction would be that administered to animals, the compound would do everything that an ARB does, but then it would have some other properties which are determined by the Barestin activation. Those we would need to see. Now, what we found is that, in fact, SII, physiologically, is a classical ARB. It lowers blood pressure, for example, when given to rats. But it also has the ability, at least in isolated myocardial cells, to increase contractility in isolated cardiac myocytes, as does angiotensin itself, but obviously through a distinct mechanism, not a G-protein mechanism. So the SII has the properties of an ARB, but then on top of that, it seems to have the ability to increase cardiac contractility, and in isolated cell systems, it's anti-apoptotic. It leads to prolonged cell survival. So we're still in the process of determining its properties, but certainly as predicted, it is an angiotensin receptor blocker, but with other seemingly positive attributes, and that's about where we are with it now. We also, here's an interesting thing for, for uh, my clinical colleagues here, such as uh, the gentleman who asked that question uh, about ARBs and beta blockers. We have a paper uh, just coming out uh, in the PNAS in the next few weeks in which we took all clinically used beta blockers that are used around the world, I think there were either 18 or 20 of them, and we asked in isolated cell systems whether any of them had the properties of the super blocker I'm talking about. That is to say, would any of the 20 or so clinically used beta blockers have the ability to stimulate Barestin-mediated signaling in addition to blocking G-protein signaling? Now, all of them block G-protein signaling. That's why they're beta blockers. But only one out of the 18 or 20 had the ability to stimulate Barestin-mediated signaling, and it did it only very weakly. But it did it. And that compound was carvedilol, Coreg, as it's called in, in, in the United States. This is interesting because, at least uh, anecdotally, carvedilol is one of the most effective beta blockers in treating heart failure. And so it leads to the conjecture that maybe this Barestin stimulatory activity is somehow related to this positive clinical profile. But we don't know that yet. Questions? Well, um, we start to characterize the beta genetic receptor with the pharmacologists. And now they, uh, we actually see more, a little bit more complicated because there's a lot of papers come out say there's homo, homo, uh, homodimerizations. So uh, in addition, there's a report says the given couple receptors probably can be transported into the nucleus. Now, my question is if we consider on top of activation of G protein and beta arresting. Then we need to consider the dimerizations with the beta genetic receptor uh, itself or with angiotensin receptor or of uh, ordinary receptor and possibility transport into the uh, nucleus. Then my question is, if we going back to look at the beta genetic blockers or beta genetic agonists, we look at the pharmacology profile, does it fit with this multiple uh, signaling pathway. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. You're asking, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, well, uh, if you look at the profile, the drug profile, we can uh, profiles, say, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, they actually sign kicks AMP and then activate the muscle contractions, all these kind of things. Right. But is this other drug activity can also explain other than activation of beta uh, arrestines, uh, other than activations of G protein, can they can be still um, explained by the dimerizations of the G protein coupled receptor or the transfer of G protein coupled receptor to the nucleus? I th so, I, I, as I understand the question, it, it's, it is whether this barest mediated signaling can somehow rationalize uh, data with various. Uh, ligands that are out there that may not have been clear before. And, you know, it's interesting. 
the overwhelming majority of drugs that we've looked at, and we've looked at quite many dozens for, say, the beta adrenergic receptor, where compared to the angiotensin receptor, there are so many more structures available. As I, as I mentioned, that was one of the reasons that I was drawn to studying that receptor. Virtually none of them show any discordant activity towards one signaling pathway or the other. A new term which has been introduced in pharmacology <clears throat> just in the last several years, and for those who are interested, there's, a, there's an issue of TIPS, Trends in Pharmacological Sciences, which came out just in the last couple of months. The entire issue is devoted to this topic. And it goes by various names, but the one I like at the moment is called biased agonism. So biased agonism means the following. Something like adrenaline stimulates, adre stimulates uh, or angiotensin at, at its receptor, stimulates G protein signaling to the same extent that it does barestin. It's balanced. Uh, a beta blocker is also balanced. It has absolutely no efficacy for either signaling pathway. Now, a, an example of a biased ligand would be angiotensin. Uh, it would be SII angiotensin because it's biased towards barestin. It doesn't do anything on G. Now, one can imagine the opposite, something that would do G and not, uh, and not barestin. But as we've looked at the ligands in clinical use, uh, both agonists, that's stimulators, or antagonists, that's blockers, almost none of them are biased at all. And so their properties fit with <clears throat> the conventional understanding of stimulation of G protein and stimu uh, stimulation of barestin or not. In other words, non-biased ligands are characterized by the fact that to the extent that they do or do not stimulate G proteins, correspondingly, they do or do not stimulate barestin recruitment. The SII is a very biased ligand. Now, to date, I just told you for the looking at 20 beta blockers, they're all unbiased, except for carvedilol, which is very slightly biased towards barestin-mediated signaling. And so to date, I think there's not a lot to explain there. But I think that as new compounds are developed, and we're very interested in doing this, then it, uh, we may get some very interesting new pharmacology. So, so Thank you, I'm Professor Lefkoff, for your expectedly most insightful lecture. I wonder if I may ask a general question, perhaps related to philosophy or engineering. If I understood correctly, biological communication has three com components. The first components are the uh, intercellular signaling molecules. They are very diverse, peptide hormones, steroid hormones, cytokines, ch and chemokines. Then the third one, the, the cytoplasmic enzyme cascades, as you illustrated, are also very diverse. The MEP kinase, the ERK. Then why is the uh, second component? your seven transmembrane G protein coupled uh, receptor has to be so uh, uh, conserved uh, and uh, common, standardized in the engineering. Thank you. Very easy for me to summarize the current thinking on this. Nobody knows. So the, <laughs> everybody has wondered why this, there must be something so fundamentally important about this structural design that it has been used over and over and over again uh, for this purpose. And the purpose being this, to receive signals and send them into the cell. And it's been used with really only minor modifications, as you say, for ligands that vary unbelievably in structure. In fact, G protein coupled receptors have as their ligands virtually every type of molecule. They even serve as sensors for ions like calcium. There's a calcium sensing receptor. There are small peptides, large peptides. The steroid hormones, which all of these years have been known to interact with the, you know, the intracellular molecules, and now it turns out they have GPCRs, lipids, everything. So I'm, just, I'm not answering your question, I'm just validating it as a very worthy a subject of, of consideration. And uh, people have been wondering about this uh, for uh, 20 years now. Uh, and no easy answer has emerged. Whether it's something about the inherent stability of that structure, that doesn't do it for me either. I, I think there's just there's something very deep, I agree with you, and fundamental here, uh, which remains to be divined.
Uh, I understand there's a student from secondary school. Uh, any question from you? If you ask, you ask uh, meaningful, good questions, we have two professors and chancellor here. So you may be accepted next year to CUHK. Any question from the secondary school student? Or given varied audience. I know. Do you know how it is to be a student? <laughs> no further questions? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I'm staff of the Department of Pharmacology. I would like to ask a very basic question is that um, we always tell our students that when an agonist binds to a receptor, it changes the conformation of the receptor and hence facilitate signal transduction. So let's say for <coughs> the angiotensin 2, okay, it binds to the angiotensin receptors, change it in one way. What about your S2 angiotensin? Does that actually change the conformation of the receptor in some other ways? Has anybody actually looked into the three-dimensional folding of the receptor uh, when it's coupled with a full agonist and one of the so-called super blocker. So you're asking about do, do, we, do we have evidence of these, uh, of the different changes in conformation of the receptor? Is that the yes. question? Yeah. yeah. So this is a, a wonderful <coughs> uh, area of study and one which I have been uh, very much drawn to in the past uh, year or so. And we're, it really sort of, uh, you've identified, if you will, the horizon of where research is <coughs> right now. And we're, this is exactly what we're trying to do. As you know, to date, there have been no crystal structures for any GPCR other than rhodopsin. Uh, but it's widely known in the research community that there will be a, a structure coming out for the beta adrenergic receptor soon. Uh, but we are currently using a variety of biophysical techniques to try to assay what's different in the shape or conformational change that occurs in a beta or angiotensin receptor in response to a ligand such as SII as opposed to angiotensin itself. And there are a variety of ways that one can approach this. There are ways of doing, for example, uh, fluorescence uh, FRET, fluorescence resonant energy, tra energy transfer, uh, or BRET, uh, where one can put probes either, for example, into different parts of the receptor molecule and then look to see are these different parts of the receptor molecule being brought closer together or further apart. There are all sorts of, of assays. We're in the early stages of developing that. There are also many other assays one can use. And uh, we, we have some, some good things coming along in that way. But yes, you, you have identified really very much the front. We would like to understand what are these conformational changes. Another very useful probe which I would like to develop, which we're working on, would be antibodies to the receptors which specifically recognize one or the other conformation. So the idea would be we have a receptor which is binding, say, SII angiotensin, and another one, say, binding angiotensin, or better yet would be another angiotensin analog, not yet invented, which can only do G protein and not barrest. And now we would have an antibody which can specifically recognize one or the other conformation. I think it'll be possible to do that, especially using phage display libraries to, to, develop, to get these antibodies. They would be amazingly useful probes, if nothing else, for the development of drugs, because you would have an assay for a compound which can put the receptor in one or the other conformation. So yes, I very much like that approach. Thank you. I think it's, uh, it's running time, uh, it's close to the end of this uh, lecture. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Lenkovic for this, such an uh, excellent talk. Uh, we learn a lot of, uh, about drug actions and pharmacology as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Professor Lefkowitz and Professor Cho. Could Professor Lefkowitz please stay and may I invite Professor Liu Park White, acting Vice Chancellor, to present the souvenir. Professor Liu, please. <laughs>
Thank you, professors. Could you please stay and for photo taking? And would Professor Ching and Professor Cho please join us? Thank you. This is the end of the lecture. Thank you so much for joining us today.